a sea anemone. What's that? It's like this little... Yeah. Didn't you see Finding Nemo? Didn't. Come on, man. It's like this... Of course. Of course I saw (laughs) Of course. The sea anemone. Sea anemone. That's hard to say. It's it's intimidating. Sea anemone. Some of us. (laughs) Sea anemone. Uh, oh, we're back again. And we're back. Jason is sticking around. This is the third one. You can't get me to leave. Yeah. I just love it. We've hired Jason full-time now. He's going to take over the podcast. I David, also don't have a code key, so I can't get out. David and I are going to just step aside and let you take it over. Okay. Well, um, I don't know what to say. <laughs> we're joined today with an amazing artist, Russell Klimas. Not Klimas. Klimas. Did Klimas. I get it right? Klimas. Hola. <laughs> Buenos dias. Russell, thanks for joining us. Yeah, dude, thanks for having me. This is going to be real fun. So you've got some uh, really unique art in the tools you use. What? How do you describe yourself as an artist? Uh, so it's one of those things where, for me, I'm always trying to push possibilities, no matter what kind of medium that I'm in, because that's what's most exciting to me. So really, it's just going to be, how can I take something that everybody's familiar with and push that into just like one step to try to improve that craft and and bring everyone along the ride. I love it. And how did you get into it? So uh, for if we're talking specifically about light painting, which yeah. is one of my favorite things ever, is I was looking up how to do, or at least this is a story I tell myself because I don't really remember, is I was looking up how to do fire photography because I have like circus performer friends. And then I was on the Google, you know, trying to f- figure stuff out. And I ran across the work of Eric Paré, who is an amazing light painter, still like easily like one of the best, most well-known in the world. And I was like, what is this? This looks like freaking magic. I have to figure out what this is. And then since then, I've just been, it's just been obsessed. So you were already a photographer and then you discovered that? Or I mean, may, like maybe six months in, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. So I was like still trying to figure stuff out. Like uh, still a baby. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. And then I saw that and I was like, yo, I don't know what this is, but sign me up. I like it. That's great. So what was your first shoot that you tried to to pull off with yeah, the uh, painting of the light? Yeah, so basically there is the style that Eric Paré does. Basically, we take what are fluorescent safety tubes. You can buy them at your local hardware store, Home Depot, Lowe's, whatever. And they normally go over fluorescent lights, and they're just these plastic tubes that, in case the fluorescent light shatters, it's captured within that tube, and they cost like $4 a piece. So all you have to do... You take that tube, you get some parchment paper, and then if you want, like, a really long gel, and you put a flashlight in the bottom of it. And so I just went out uh, one night to, like, a little, this little park with my friend Hannah, and I was like, let's just try this stuff. And I'm, like, trying to use, like, you know, an infrared remote to get the camera to start, to give me that five-second lead to try to get, like, a light painting done. And that was kind of, like, the first time I really tried. And then from there, it's like, okay, cool. You know, I have the idea. Mm -hmm. Now let's refine it and really try to push it more. Right. What's so how the, do you like, like what's the average amount of time that you have like your shutter speed to do stuff like that? Or does it vary a lot? So honestly, it's going to vary a lot depending uh, on a multitude of factors. So it's either your environment. So if I'm, you know, outside and I'm shooting a blue hour or sunset, I'm going to have a really, really fast shutter speed because it's going to be overexposed unless I'm using like an ND filter. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have that or say it's at night or you have a, you're inside a studio, you know, it can be much longer. For me, uh, I do not like to have to think about another variable. So I either will have it always set to be on the, like eight seconds always, or I'll have a remote trigger so I can end and begin it whenever I want. And then I don't have to worry about that time sense. Mm-hmm. And that just makes the whole process a lot easier. Are there any cameras that have built-in ND filters that aren't made for video? Uh, have they I, done I, that yet? Because why haven't they? Yes, I believe there is. Um, I don't remember which one it is, but I remember reading about them working on something like that, which I, yeah, I don't remember which one it is, but I've seen it. Because um, ND is the, un, it's the most unsexy uh, filter to be putting on your camera, mm-hmm. right? It's like, mm-hmm. that should just be a button, you know? Stop that. Yeah, we right. We, we put on. a man on the moon 60 years ago and we needed, I need how many of these ND filters to carry around? Get out of here. Yeah. And, and even then, like. I mean, that's debatable, the whole man on the moon. <laughs> wait, you, <laughs> huh? wait. We've got a denier. <laughs> you believe in the no, moon? No, no, yeah. <laughs> the moon. He hates you, too. 
Remember. No, that was R.E. No, was it R.E.M.? Who put it? What's the man on the moon? Who's home? You should know that. That's R.E.M. That's R.E.M. Yeah. Why? I should okay. know that because I'm old. Why? No, you, <laughs> in the last episode, you said that that was your like period of time. That's that, okay. that music. That's yeah. true. Yes. Yeah. But but even with... But also, you're old. <laughs> with, <laughs> even with an ND filter, right, is that, okay, cool, I'm stopping more light, but on that same level is now I have to increase the amount of output my flashlight or whatever light tool I'm using in order to help fight the sun, but also, you know, still make a light painting. So you're still, like, fighting against yourself yeah. in some sense. So while, you know, that can solve a problem, for example, if you're trying to shoot in the middle of the day and you're in shade, an ND filter might be useful in that case. Mm -hmm. But it, it's really variable on, you know, what is your environment and then what is the power of your tool? What, what companies now are making tools specifically for light painting? Are they, or are you guys constantly just modifying what <laughs> everyone else is using? Yeah, so basically there, uh, over the years as I've been into it, because I've, again, I've only been into light painting for around five years or so. And, you know, even, over that amount of time, the light painting community and what's been available has changed a lot. So I am an ambassador for Anson and Mellon flashlights. And the reason that I really like them is their flashlight. It's it has up to like 33 different colors that you can choose. It has, um, it's, I believe that the LEDs inside are RGB and white, but they've really, really worked on that to try to get it as pure white as possible, which is really nice. And then they have a load of different attachments that you can use with the same flashlight. And on top of that is if you want, because it's made for light painters, but it's also made for like performance artists. So it's movement reactive. It's sound reactive. You can program in your own color sequences or whatever. So it gives you a lot of flexibility and you can get a lot of unique looks with one light. And that is why I really, really like it. Nice. I see a lot of stuff on your website or there's been a few that are done with drones. Mm -hmm. Are you doing this with the drones or are you just in the right place at the right time? Yeah, no. So I uh, programmed the drone and from basically in 2017, I was like, uh, I saw by this guy named, by the name of Phil Fisher, who's a light painter. And I saw him doing stuff with drones and I was like, yo, okay, that's awesome. But he was doing it by hand. And I'm like, I ain't got no time for that. Okay, so what do you I, mean by by hand? So he like he did a pentagram in the sky. He literally flew the drone by hand in a long oh, exposure. Okay. Got it. And and did it that way. And I'm like, I just I'm not gonna put in the time for that. So I spent like one morning. It was in November. I remember specifically like in my bed. I'm like, all right, there's got to be a way. Set the scene. Set yeah. The right. Scene. Yeah. And uh, so basically, it's you take Google Earth Pro, and then there's a, a, a program called Litchi that you can buy on the App Store for Android or Apple. And basically is you just take what's called an image overlay. So I just put an image overlay into Google Earth Pro. It can be any image. I've done Shrek. I've done Hamilton, whatever, right? And you just basically plot out and you trace it. And then at certain points, depending on what you're trying to do, if you're trying to shoot it like just straight up in the sky to get the stars, or if you're going to turn that flat piece and make it vertical, and then that can determine, you know, the height that you have to deal with or whatever and how long that's going to be. And then you can draw anything because it's already programmed out for you. What's the most inappropriate thing you've put in this guy? <laughs> oh, boy. I knew that was what <laughs> was going next. I mean, I just, let's get it out of the I way. Mean, I mean, yeah, now, straight up. Have you made like, a huge dog? Dude, come on. I, so I haven't, <laughs> but I know people who have because, of course. And wh uh, where's that Facebook group? Because I want to join it. I need, to, uh, <laughs> I need to see what's been made. Dong Skyriders. Right? <laughs> the Dong Skyriders. Oh, man. <laughs> Sounds unique. Sounds, I, I would should, join that group. Yeah. You should protect that name. I'm going to register that. Amazing. <laughs> But what is, okay, so I'm not completely, I'm a little slow, guys. So um, you're, what you're doing is you're taking a picture of a drone and the drone is like drawing something out for you. I mean, I don't understand. Yeah. I'm, I'm a couple steps no, behind. You're so this. good. So basically what happens is, again, we're all dealing with long exposures, right? So what I'll do is I kind of will find out what kind of light painting I'm trying to do, horizontal or vertical, or for stop motion, whatever. And if I can, I will draw a frame first, just like a box around it, so I can know for sure that where I have my camera is that it's going to be in the frame because it's really hard to tell from the ground. So I'll do that first, and then once I so have what, that... Okay, slow down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is that? We drawing, where are you drawing this? I mean, what, what, what is... So the drone is mean? taking the light okay. in a very specific pattern. Correct. Yeah. And a long exposure. It's drawing it in the sky. Okay, so you're... 
making sure it all will fit into your frame. Yep. How? So, I mean, I will literally just, I don't even like have to run a camera, right? I'll literally just, okay, cool. I'm going to guess that it's probably around here. I'll set up my camera and then I'll have the drone just fly and I'll just look at the back of my camera. Be like, okay, oh, it went out of frame. Let me adjust my camera oh, okay, okay. and no, then try again right. until I get it to that point. A really useful tool and it's really good for social media, for any kind of light painting, honestly. If you have uh, an iPhone, there's an app called Photor Gear. It's totally free. And basically, it allows you to do video light painting. So what I'll do a lot if I'm doing social media stuff is, you know, I'll be like, hey, you know, I drew, you know, flew this thing with my drone. And then you'll actually see it being made, but just sped up in real time. Or like sped up real time, whatever you want to call that. Mm-hmm. And then you can like see how it's being made at that same time as you're doing it. So I'll have it running while I'm going because then if there's an issue, like if wind blows it off course or I mess something up, I can see it happening instead of having to wait the entire time to end the exposure to realize I messed up. So the, the one specifically on your website that I'm talking about, and Jason, you should look at it, the horse running. Mm-hmm. How was that done? And did you, did you do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, how, what sort of sorcery made that happen? I what mean, it's hell, what we're man? talking about, but you right, did right, it right. over and over again. So, right. So how? yeah, that's kind of like the next step. And what's, cr- it's really, really easy. It's just taking the idea and you're just, Basically is, so that was 13 frames, okay? So all I did was, I was like, okay, uh, we all know the the famous, like, film of the guy riding the horse, and we're trying to figure out, like, does the horse leave the ground or are all four mm-hmm. hooves on the ground at the same time? So I took that, and I cut it up frame by frame, and there's, like, you know, just free things that you can use on the internet to do that. Then all I did was take each frame, image overlay into Google Earth Pro, and I just put them all on top of each other. And then I just mapped out each one and I took out the rider. You know, I made some liberties for whatever. And then all I did was, okay, cool. So now I'm just going to, you know, the drones are going to start and I can see on my phone when it's going to start, what point it's going to go to. And as soon as I see when it it says going to point one, and and as soon as I see it says it's going to point two, I start my exposure. And then it'll just fly through all the points. And each one of those frames was under 99 waypoints. And that's just, you know, it has to go from point to point. And, you know, I've done up to easily 500 before within one shot. And, okay, so it would just go through the first frame, done, sweet. And my exposure, next frame, I just do the same thing. And then you just have to bring it, like, into Photoshop, into the video timeline, and you just put them together. That's crazy. You made that sound so simple, but, oh, man, there's a lot of planning that goes into this. It's the way I like to explain it is like it's complex but not complicated. Yeah. And right. I have YouTube videos on step by step how I do this for me and for other people because I forget things a lot of the time. <laughs> if you were a gambling man, do you think a couple of guys like us could figure this oh, out? Or are you like, no, not a problem. No, not for you. That's why I have the tutorials. And I have, oh, a, right. I have a Facebook group where people share stuff and we help each other out. How do we get in? What are the questions I have to ask to get into uh-huh. this group? It's, it's literally, do you agree to answer all three questions? That's like question number one. And a lot of people don't even get that. And then it's like, uh, do you agree to like share your settings and help people when they're trying to do stuff? And then there's one other one that's like really easy. It's just to weed out like the bots and stuff that get in. But it's super easy. Like you know, I always try to make sure people, you, you know. pledge sh- allegiance. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool, man. How do you mix that when you're doing, um, you know, are, are you like working also with, um, like when you do something that's more traditionally like a portrait or something mm-hmm. with the light, mm-hmm. are you also mixing with flash? Do you work with flash or do you do everything with the light painting? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I've definitely done it with flash. And even then, like if we're talking about using drones with portraits at the same time, just to like, let's have fun with it. You know, like I've attached LEDs to my drone, like a huge strip with just like a external battery. Mm-hmm. And you can use that to light paint with whether you want to go around a person or like, I've drawn the um, the rainbow flag in the sky, which was cool, and it looks like fabric almost, which I not which I did not expect. Mm. And so there's lots of different avenues in that. But I think oftentimes, like I've used a lot of um, different setups that like that Lindsay Adler has done with you know fashion setups or whatever. So I have like you know three lights and then like an uplight or like a reflector, and then I'll do some light painting crown or something behind their head to give it that you know that beauty fashion look. But then we add light painting to it, mm. and you know it's. Any kind of light really can benefit. It just depends on 
how you want to do it. And one of the most common questions I get asked is, do you do front curtain sync or rear curtain sync when your flash goes off? Mm. And honestly, it's up to you. It doesn't really matter in most cases. If you're trying to do something like if you want to do something with a dancer and you want to, you have a constant light on one side and then that light's hitting them and they're moving through the frame and then I freeze them at the end, then you have to do rear curtain sync because it wouldn't work any other way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about the gear that you use Mm because I think the Inspire was the last drone that I had and I sold it and I just kind of gave up on it because of, I think there were so many rules. You had to really take that test, didn't have time to take the test. Mm -hmm. So we just hire them when we need now but um how since the inspire how has that technology changed what are you using and like what gets you the most excited about drone technology because it's it's that's fascinating and Mm -hmm. tiny now yeah so i just for the longest time i just use the mavic pro and that's all i used right so beginner drone like you know it's really old now i finally just died because i couldn't fix it anymore i don't know why but you know like whatever and they're not that hard to fix anyway, at least, you know, the Mavic Pro, Mavic Pro 2. It's when you get into, like, FPV stuff that it starts to become a pain in the butt to fix. Because you just have to know how to solder, really, at the end of the day. And what's P- FPV? Uh, f- First-person view. So if you've ever seen the drone footage of, like, people getting these crazy turns and, like... Yeah, like it's the like bo- a race car. Yeah, or, like... F1 the, of drones. A lot of people have seen, like, the bowling alley footage of somebody going through and doing a yeah. one-shot take. All FPV, right? And that's a whole other avenue. And you can also do light panning with that. Uh, my friend Colin and I, I was like, Colin, like you're an amazing FPV pilot. Let's try to combine light painting. So we went out one time with a friend in a park. We lit up this parachute dress we had and we attached lights to the drone. And he could just see barely enough that he was able to do like spirals and stuff around the person using FPV. Yeah. I've heard some stories about uh, people that were drone pilots that tried to do FPV and wasted a lot of money really quickly. What is your experience with like the how complex it is or how hard is it to make that jump? So what I would recommend, one, uh, and this is a lot of this advice is from my friend Colin because I haven't done it much myself, but it's basically, you know, find an emulator that, you, that will really try to mimic real world and spend a lot of time in that first. And you want to try to keep it in what's called acro mode because that is the most flexible of modes. And any other mode is really going to handicap you because it's trying to help you when it's just going to hinder you once you get to acro mode. So it's one of those things, get used to the emulators, try to make it as real as possible. And then once you've spent a lot of time in there, then switch to real life and just, you know, start in open field, start easy. Don't try to push yourself and just get used to that because in, in real life you have to deal with like wind resistance when in an emulator, you don't really deal with that. And then there's like small other little things that can affect it. So it's just one of those things, put it into practice Because they're so easy to crash. Yeah. Yeah. True or false? If you're really good at Call of Duty, (laughs) you're really good at FPV drone. (laughs) I'm going to have to go with false on that one. (laughs) Where are you? uh, Come on. Where are you with the sound effects, man? Come on. Oh, you know, know, I've just been trying to be, (laughs) I've just been trying to get more mature in my use Uh, of them, you know? That's that's like my favorite, you know, my favorite. I'll let you do this. This next episode, you'll be in the hot seat. I don't, I don't like all the technical stuff. I'm not a technical person. This is pushing buttons ain't technical. I'll tell you what. <laughs> tell you what. <laughs> yeah. So what can I, I want to go back and just be like, you know, just so the the people who, you know, the the legions of fans we have listening to this right now mm-hmm. uh, know a little bit about who you are. You know, can you tell us about where you come from? What's your, you know, background? How did you get? into this crazy world and and everything just introduce yourself a little bit so we you know we kind of jumped in straight into the light painting without actually establishing yeah 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 who russell is uh so basically you know i kind of just stumbled into photography i think where are you from oh i'm from colorado okay colorado springs colorado it's born and raised kind of moved here and there for different things but ended up just coming back there because i had family there okay so i was like that makes sense and do you know Shannon Squires? Oh, of course. She's like a super close friend of mine. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I love her. Yeah. Fantastic. We love you, Shannon. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. And you, you live there now? Mm-hmm. In Colorado. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, then I kind of found photography. I don't really remember how. Oh, I, I was working on a, came back, I was living in California, came back to Colorado and I was doing film out there. 
And then there was a Netflix movie that was being filmed in Colorado. And I was like, hey, I was just doing this in California. Let me get in on this. Mm -hmm. Ended up working locations. And we went up to like the Continental Divide or somewhere in the mountains. I had my phone out at sunrise. And I was, you know, like, I'm going to take pics on the cell phone, whatever. Right? I'm just having a good time. And I took a picture and I was like, dang, maybe I should get into this. Mm -hmm. And that kind of like sparked my curiosity into photography. And then it's kind of, you know, just trying to find your, your style, your thing. When it, then it came across light painting like we talked about before. And then really it's just come down to, okay, cool. The way that I think is best to study kind of any craft is let me copy someone's style so I get comfortable with it, find out how it works, and then I put in my own spin mm -hmm. on it, right? right? So, you know, I started with tubes because that was really easy, accessible, not hard to do. And then I found like lightpaintingbrushes.com and they have different blades and fiber optics and all these other tools. And I was like, okay, cool. And that's, you know, that's still great gear, especially if you don't want to have to buy like a specific flashlight that works with certain tools. They have what's called the universal connector and it works with a multitude of different flashlights. And you can just like, if you get some PVC pipe and some acrylic, you can make your own blades or whatever, and it will all work. So that's a really, really nice tool that you can use. And then kind of from there, it's kind of branched out and trying different techniques like Jason Page, who runs that, he showed me, he would be like, okay, cool, you know, this is how I do like light painting wings. And he would turn the flashlight on and off. And for me, you know, one, that's a long time. It's going to be a few minutes to do some wings or, and I was like, that's awesome. That's a great technique. But for me, I don't want to wait or have my model wait that long. So instead I would put it on strobe and you can get some nice wings by just the flashlight being on strobe and it's just going to capture the light for each pulse. And as mm -hmm. long as you continue to move it, then you can get some really cool shapes. Okay. And so the model, when you're working with them, they have to be completely frozen the whole time or you're going to get like ghosting, right? So yes and no. It, they only need to not move when the light is on them. Mm. If the okay. light's not on them, then it doesn't really matter because cameras only take in light. Mm. So for example, something that can be a happy accident potentially is say I hit them with a front curtain sink first and I'm doing some light painting and then they move a little bit in between that time. Now you might get like this shadow and you might see some details in that shadow and it creates like this extra cool effect that you didn't mean to do intentionally. Right. And so you can use it to your advantage if you can recognize on how to duplicate it. That's really cool. It kind of looks like their soul, you know, it's just like right there, just a little out of body. Their aura. Mm -hmm. Aura. And it's and there is like a ghosting that can happen like with a shutter drag or something, but this is like, it's like a darkness. This is the best way I can. Do you believe it. in ghosts? <laughs> We're going there, are we? Well, let's do it. <laughs> I was going to ask that myself. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen a ghost while you were taking pictures? Mm. Well, you could say that I'm the ghost because a lot of the time you might like see me in the back of a light painting photo. You're like, who is that guy? <laughs> <laughs> That's like the ultimate copyright protection. <laughs> oh, good. That was a good. Uh -huh. That was actually was, me. That was me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. Because, like, my friend Mia, we did a, a light painting shoot, and she's, like, a violinist sort of deal. And she thinks it's hilarious that if you look close enough, you can just, like, see me with my glasses on in the background behind the light <laughs> yeah. painting. It's yep. like, yep, I, I took it because I'm in it. So let's talk about safety a little bit, mm -hmm. which you wouldn't expect coming out of my mouth. No? Oh, okay. Man. But uh, just what are the best practices and rules for people that maybe have just you know, bought a drone off the shelf, mm -hmm. they are very dangerous. So, like, what are the, the, the things people that aren't taking the test should do to, to make sure they don't hurt anyone? Great question. So, basically, first off, if you get, if any, you buy a drone that's over uh, 50 grams, I believe, is that you have to get a hobbyist license no matter what. Oh, you do now? You have to. Okay. And so, it's really easy to do. Uh, you can go to the FAA website. I believe it's called the Trust Verification or Certification. And you, it takes like 10 minutes to do, and you can take it as many times as you want, but it's going to tell you a lot of the safety things that you're going to want to know for a drone, just so you're aware that, hey, you know, you need to be aware of these things so you don't hurt people. So that's the first thing that you should always do. We used to need to have a night waiver if you wanted to fly at night, and that isn't needed anymore. I don't really know why they changed that, but it's not. And even then, you just have to, you know, write in a letter, say, hey, this is what I'm going to be doing, blah, blah, blah. And then they would generally accept it. It's kind of a cool name, Night Waver. Yeah, right. Like, it does, like almost Night like Night Rider. Like my call sign. Uh-huh. Call sign Night Waver. <laughs> I am all about the rules. <laughs> right. And then, of course, if you want to make money with drones of any, of any way, you have to take your Part 107. 
And Tony Northrup does a really good YouTube video. It's around an hour and a half or so long where he goes over a lot of that information other than like remote ID, which is going to have to come into effect this year in September where you have to have that on your drone no matter what. And it's just for safety things. So like people trying to fly a drone near an airport, like an idiot, people can like kind of track that drone and figure out where it is to reprimand the person who's being irresponsible. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's, you know, you're going to have to practice your METAR and TAF reports and then how to read aviation maps. And you can find a lot of that information online for free. You don't need to go buy a paid course or anything like that. I just studied by myself and I was able to pass it no problem. Nice. And the drones now, they prevent you from breaking some of these laws, right? Like you can't go to an airport. Is it, does it, <sighs> it depends. alarm bells go off? It depends on the drone. So if you're using like a DJI drone, they have the, the term is called geofencing and they will stop you from flying. Like if, if I'm like, so there's the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. And if I try to fly it like off of the interstate that's near that area or any businesses there, it won't let me take the drone off. I can't take it off the, the ground. But if you're using something like an Octel drone, for example, they don't have geofencing. So it allows for you to fly anywhere. Freedom. Yeah. Yep. Freedom so, drones. yeah, really <laughs> freedom, really, though, there should be one like that. But uh, so, yeah, Take really away depend. my rights, my flying rights. Uh, yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in Colorado Springs, like, that is a huge Air Force. Is it just the whole thing geofenced? You got to drive for hours? No, 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 not at all. Um, there is by my park. And even then, uh, you can fly, like, so there's Memorial Park, which is in Colorado Springs. And there's certain areas of it that I can fly in no problem. And even if, uh, so there's a park that's next to my house where, you know, they're saying, hey, like this is an area where you need to be cautious because there is potential things that will fly overhead. You can still fly there. You just can't go as high as you potentially normally would. And so there's there's certain limitations, uh, limitations. And if you use an app called Before You Fly, that will let you know, like in this area, can I fly here or not? Just to save you time in case yeah. you get there and you find you can't. Interesting. So... Uh who are your clients? Are you doing this for money? Is this still a hobby? Like, Yeah, so basically uh, I work with my friend Steve. who He has a, a gallery service that we use for Colorado Springs that does a lot of photo and video. So I'll go down to a, do events, do photo and video there, and then we'll get some drone footage as well. So I'll use it for that aspect, and then that's, that's just a subscription model for the Chamber of Commerce or whatever other businesses that want to use it for ads. And then I actually just got like my first commercial gig with uh, the brand PUBG. And they were like, hey, you know, they found me on TikTok and they were like, can you draw our character with light painting? And I was like, yeah, like I can either, you know, do it this way or this way. We ended up going the drone way. And, you know, I just kind of, cool, this is what I want to do for you. And they, you know, can we have it in a square, a horizontal and a vertical format? And then I just sent it off and we were good to go. So, and at that point, it really kind of depends on how complicated do you want to get. So whether it's me doing stop motion, that's going to be more expensive because it's a lot more work versus me just doing a video oh. and like an image at the end. Are a lot of uh, drone uh, you know, flyers, drone users, what, what's the a proper term? Drone pilots. Drone pilots. 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 I should have, on, that was man. easy. <laughs> All right. So, are, and this is a question for you too, but are there many drone pilots that do like the creative fun side, but then also like a lot with agriculture and like farmers to like map stuff out? Because there's... So much technology on that side as well. You guys yeah. do both? So it, it really kind of depends. So one of the, a lot of what a lot of people can do is like what's called photogrammetry. And there's actually a lot of uses for that in particular skill, whether it's you are going over a construction site and you are uh, kind of getting like a, a time lapse of what's going on. Or if you're trying to get, like if you look at Google Maps, for example, it's not a perfect overhead shot. There's going to be some kind of shadow that you're going to see. So with photogrammetry, you can actually make it a perfectly top-down shot. And so that can be useful for a lot of things. The other things that a lot of people can use drones for is you can, say you're scanning um, an object, you're going around like a building, you can take that photogrammetry you did and make it into a video game asset. And you can oh, sell wow. that, which is really cool. And there's like YouTube tutorials on how to do that sort of stuff. There's another one where before we had drones, a lot of the time if you have a construction building, they would, you know, you would guess like, okay, cool. You know, we have this much soil, we have this much that or whatever. But now using the volumetric data that you can get from the video and the drone with that sort of technique is they can tell you in like how many kilos or whatever, how much 
you know, what soil you have or how many metal pipes you have, and you can get accurate taxes and how they're going to do for that. So it's, it's allowing people to be more accurate because before it was, we're going to put someone in a plane and they're going to take pictures and we're going to make our best guess. Wow. So I, I like to focus on the psychological side of things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you're learning these things and when you're developing your, um, you know, skill and probably having a lot of things not turn out the way that you want them to, mm -hmm. you know, what is your way of kind of like, how have you kept going and, you know, gotten over any of that, like, uh, feeling like when you were first starting and maybe mm -hmm. things weren't turn, turning out the way you wanted them to, what was your kind of way of approaching that from a mental point of view? So with light painting, um, whether it's drone, whether it's portraits, whatever, uh, I kind of adapt the mindset that Eric Paré has a lot of the time, which is if I get one photo, I'm happy mm. because light painting, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. And it's a lot of, you're trying to get as much in camera as possible because you're trying to, with light painting, the idea is look at this amazing effect that I didn't have to use like Photoshop or something for. And that's part of the challenge. And that's part of like what makes it so fun. And so as long as if I even, and even if I don't get shot out of it, if I learn something, mm -hmm. then it's a success, right? right? With drone stuff, I don't, I don't think I've ever programmed a drone shot and gotten it right the first time. Like something fails, some points are too close to each other or whatever. I'm like all right, I'll come back tomorrow and just try again. Right. And that's like very normal. Uh -huh. So if you have patience or if you want to build patience, this is a great way to do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, you know, one of the things that would be help, like I've, I'm starting from zero with something like this. I've, I've always wanted to add this to, you know, what I'm already doing. It, it seems like the next frontier, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So what, just to, to get beyond like some of the first mistakes you made when you first started, what, like for somebody like me, what could you say would be like things to avoid doing that didn't work for you? Yeah. Um, so one is be okay with failing. Okay. That's like number one, cause yeah, you're going to fail. That's like, that's super normal. Another thing is uh, when you're working with a model, if you work with any model you normally do, you have to let them know this is completely different from normal modeling. You're not going to be changing positions all the time. Right. You might stay in the same position for 10 minutes, right? So be used to that. And then uh, a really good tip is you, when I'm working with a model and I want them to wear a long dress if I'm using tubes. The reason being is when you do a tube shape, like a basic circle, if they have a long dress, it not only hides the beginning and end of that light painting shape, but it also hides my feet. So it looks perfect and I don't show up. Right. Otherwise, it's really easy for you to see my feet, which, you know, though you could clone out. But again, we don't want to do that. Right. So you have those things. And then the other thing is I have a lot of people ask me, like, you know, what is your aperture at? Like, it's they're so clear. Mm -hmm. Right. And the aperture doesn't matter. It matters if the model moves or not when the light is on them. And that mm -hmm. is a struggle that a lot of people have is they'll they always ask, like, why is my model not clear? And it's like it's because they move. Mm. So generally, if it's below 10 seconds exposure, I will tell the model, hey, you're going to hold your breath for this, and I'll let you know when you can relax. So basically how I kind of run it down is I'm going to go, okay, cool, everyone in the room, if I'm working with a group of people, like because I'm teaching a workshop tomorrow, right, I'll be like, okay, cool. So I'm going to go three, two, one, on one. We're going to start our exposure. Our model here is not going to move. And then when I say relax or, or uh, if I say shutter, then you guys can end your exposure if you want to. Right. Because then if, say, you're working with other light painters, they want to, you know, throw in a filter and light them a different way or add in their own thing. Mm -hmm. They can, can continue to expose and get their shot and make it more, you know, different or unique than anybody else's. Mm -hmm. So I'd say, like, those are the biggest things is is don't worry, you know, make sure your model doesn't move and teach them that way. And then start with I, I always I always recommend tubes because it's the easiest thing. And the, the biggest mistake with tubes that I find is a lot of people will try to make a circle and they'll move their arm. And it's not an arm movement. It's a wrist movement mm -hmm. because that was, that's what keeps the circle really clean. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, did you write that down? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just clean circles. You know, it's like we're recording. Perfect circles. We're recording this or something, but it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everybody has to have a tripod too, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're gonna want a tripod. I know that's a very basic question, but no, for, but no, know. it's important though. And um, I mean, any tripod really works. I mean, if you don't have one, like you find a desk or a chair or something, you just make it work, right? Right. It it doesn't really matter as long as the camera doesn't move. Now, if you're doing like shutter drag or you're doing like a kinetic kind of photography where it's handheld and you move it to create those trails. Right. Or you can do it that way. Or another like fun thing is, so you guys are probably familiar with like focus poles or zoom poles. Mm. So we've all seen photos of fireworks before, right? And they all look the same, right? You, you know, everybody like videos fireworks and they never look at that thing again. They just right. don't, right? Yeah. So what's really fun to do is I did this a few years ago. I didn't have a tripod. I was just out at the park. So I sat down, I put the camera between my legs, like just kind of like hunched over and I did a focus pull on the fireworks and now it takes those fireworks and it makes them look like sea anemones mm-hmm. because of the way that it's coming out in a long exposure. It makes them look like what? A sea anemone. What's that? It's sea like this little, cr- yeah. It's Didn't like this you little- see Finding Nemo? Didn't. Come on, man. It's like no, this. Uh, of course. Of course. I saw <laughs> of course. The sea anemone. Sea an- <laughs> it's hard to say. It's, um, a, it's intimidating. Sea anemone. Some of us. <laughs> sea anemone. <laughs> see? Well, that was, that was also part of Finding Nemo. If you, yeah. you know, I've seen it like. But you know, if you've seen it, you would know. Yeah. yeah. If you see it. Now, now you know. Yeah. If you don't know. Bell <laughs> <laughs> And it's back. Full it's circle. back. You know, <laughs> call back to Bell Bibs, though. You uh, never really go away. So if you, are you limited by budget at all with, with what you want to do? Is there, like, something you're limited by, like, the gear that'd be too expensive or the location or? Not 100%. I really try to focus on because, like, one, I don't have a big budget for a lot of things, right? Because for me, light painting has always been fun. And it's one of those things where I would never recommend someone trying to go, I'm going to do light painting full time because it's, the market isn't really there for it. There are certain things, like if you have the right connections, if you want to do cars, for example, you're generally not going to do, hey, I'm going to light paint a car and have this trail. You're going to do a composite and you're going to light paint certain parts of it and bring it together in Photoshop. And they look amazing. And so like that's one avenue that you can do. And if, you know, somebody has, if they're a rich person and they have a car and they want like an image of their car that looks amazing, light painting hands down is the best way to do it. Uh, there's a guy I met at Imaging USA, and he goes around the country and takes images of planes, and he will light paint planes, like private planes, and they look amazing. So, like, it's a really good way to accent and really bring out certain aspects of a vehicle. So that's definitely one way that, like, if you want to make that your full-time gig, you can do that. But other than that, if you're trying to work with portraits, very much, you know, it's, hey, I have this wedding client or the senior portrait, and you're like, hey, let's do that. Let's add this thing on the end because – they're going to get so jazzed by it. And we're always trying to find that emotional connection so that when they see their photos, like those are the photos that they want. And light painting is a great way to have them leave the session, like feeling ecstatic. Mm. How do you feel about the ones where they do like the sparklers and they like write love? Is that like, I mean, it's light painting and it's yeah. what most people are familiar with. But right. You just kind of look at that and go like amateur hour. <laughs> <laughs> it's only amateur hour because they don't know what else is available. Right. Right. Okay. That's how a lot of people start. And for me, I'm like, that's amazing. Like, continue to do more. And if you want to learn more, like, here's some stuff I've done. And let me know if you're interested. And the light painting community, it's very much, we just want to grow it as much as possible. So if you have a question, just ask. And we're more than happy to, like, bring you in and teach you what we know because we just want to share the love that we have. What would you say that light painters in general have in common? Are you guys like Star a, Wars. A, a quirky Hunter bunch? Oh, easy, right? I Everyone. Mean, is, that's the third question. Do you like Star Wars? Yeah, I enjoy yeah, Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I, I partake of the Star but Wars. But I think with the lightsabers, like how right. mu- how often are you guys like, oh, oh, I mean, this. you know it's like the first thing you do. Yeah, right? Yeah, Boom. yeah I got to test ah, it out, right? I need that sound. Damn it. I never yeah. have the sound that we need. Yeah, <laughs> and, you can, and you can totally, like, if you have a lightsaber, it works great for light painting. Like, don't think it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, but you got to be careful because you can really burn your oh, yeah. self. Oh, yeah. Most definitely. I mean... With the LED? No, with the lightsaber. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, these are real? Yeah, <laughs> man. You didn't what? know? Come yeah. on. You've had gloves the entire time? <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I really, like, you know, uh, the, the thing that I, I was looking for the other day, uh, and, and this might lead into some sort of question, but 
Uh, I just thought I'd um, keep talking. Um, the the thing that you were doing with I'm the here for it. <laughs> God damn. Where did she come? From? I was like, what in the heck? Um, you were doing. I I got on Amazon the other day and I was looking for um the kind of fiber optic mm-hmm. things that you were looking for, and my my impression was that you you know one of the things that you do is just trying to find really cool kind of almost like you know, stuff that you would find just kind of like toys and things mm-hmm. that you like to use and then kind of like figure out ways to mess with them. The 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 image that I really loved was the one that you had just kind of gone over somebody's face with mm-hmm. fiber optic um, lights. Mm-hmm. Now, can you talk a, a little bit about like where you would find something like sure. that and how you work with that? Yeah. Uh, so a lot. Get, of uh, let me let me just get before you say that. Yeah. What's your Instagram? So people okay. who are listening to this can actually look at what we're talking about. Yeah, so my Instagram is light, the letter N, and then L-E-N-S-E. Okay. So light and lens, and you know, I, I tried to get like a better spelled one, but you know, they didn't have it available, and I'm like, I'll Sorry. just go with it. But... So wait, point, point, point. Are you keep on doing no. That's three menus to the right. I got oh, like, oh, two goodness. buttons, swipe yeah. to the right. How dare you? <sighs> <laughs> so fiber optics. Keep going. just ignore us. Uh, <laughs> there's a couple different ways, depending on the kind of tool that you want to use. If you want to get really thick fiber optic and kind of make your own tool out of it, you can find that on Amazon pretty easily. I know Eric Paré has a tutorial on how to make them yourself. And those are really more like fiber optic, um, like, like thick whips mm-hmm. and they give a different effect. But then Don't me th- <laughs> I, knew it. I, I was like, why. I knew you were going to go whips. somewhere. <laughs> Wait, did you have something there? I didn't hear for it. thick whips. Just, <laughs> 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 I knew it. I knew it. I thought it was going to be like, uh, what would it, Sir Mix a lot? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Thick All right. Lips. Anyway. Sorry. My edibles are kicking in no, now. That's so good, now, now every childish thing is funny <laughs> to me. You know? Oh, <laughs> I'm yeah. I'm thinking about everything. I as soon as I said it, I was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I said it. Now we're on the same pitch. And so you have that option. Mm-hmm. But then either you can go to lightpaintingbrushes.com or uh, ansonamelon.com and you can find the tools there, they're not crazy expensive. I mean, you're going to want to, you're going to want a flashlight. You can get like the, at least I believe the Falamov 18650 is still a good flashlight and it costs around 20, 25 bucks, I think. The Falamov. Yeah. And that's a great starter flashlight because it's not expensive and you get around like 800 lumens, which is pretty good for how small of a flashlight it is. And you want those smaller flashlights anyway to be able to use with tubes or any other kind of tool. But then all you'll do is, if you're using like the light painting brushes, fiber optics with the universal connector, you just connect those two things, put in a flashlight, and then you're good to go. And it's as simple as you start your exposure, depending on, you know, you'll adjust your settings, but generally it'll be around ISO 100, probably like F9. It could be higher, lower, depending on what you're going for. And then Mm. you really don't need more than 10 seconds. And you can do, you know, a self-portrait that way. You can paint other people and you get different looks depending on if you go down the face or up the face. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is just to be careful that the fiber optics doesn't poke someone in the eye as you're going with it because that has happened Mm -hmm. from what I've heard. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, you know, being careful with that. Yeah, (laughs) it's never happened. I've never done it, Mm -hmm. but I know other people who have. Supposedly, a little (laughs) suspicious. So I'm on the website, light painting brushes. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about glitter orbs. This is insane. Do you know what, you know what <laughs> yeah, the yeah, glitter yeah. orb is? The Holy, totally this, kicked in how complicated point. is the <laughs> so if, I mean, hey, God, so how colors on this is the glitter orb, man? <laughs> so just so I have it correct in my <laughs> head, it's it's basically, you know, it just looks like an orb, right? And then it just looks like this this random orb in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, it's like a microorganism came to life and is coming for us. Yeah, so for that, I'm, a, I'm assuming with the tool, they have these what are called glitter sticks, which is basically... You have a PV, not a PVC, but um, fluorescent safety tube, and you put just uh, pipe cleaners that are glitter inside of it, like the glittery pipe cleaners, and you put a flashlight. And then all you have to do to make an orb, Dang. it's really simple. Uh, there's a couple different ways. Some people will use like a ball that has lights on, and you can swing it, or you can literally be in the center, and then you just uh, imagine like you have like north, south, east, and west. And then all you have to do is you should know that when you're doing these, you don't have to do 360. You only have to do 180 because of the depth of how it's going to work, how the camera's going to see it. Mm-hmm. So I'll start, I'll use my feet as my guide. So I will look to, I'll start on my left, and I'll start from the bottom and bring it up, and then I'll just move my feet over a little bit, and then I'll just do the same process. And if you do that, you can make an orb of any kind. Wow. 
Wow. I like, I really like this because it's the perfect amount of like getting high activity and then also blending yes. technicals into it. Yes. Cause it's like, you get high, you're like, let's create something silly looking. Uh-huh. How do we do it? Oh, <laughs> so once you get the <laughs> fundamentals down, <laughs> oh. the yeah. orbs, the limit. We, we, yes. we, we, well, I'll, on that note, Russell, I know you probably have a busy week and we want to thank you for coming by. So we appreciate it. Do you want to end it with any final thoughts or promote anything you have coming up? Where can people go? Share some wisdom with us. Yeah. Help wizard, us out. Wizard wisdom. Bring us, wizard bring us wisdom. your wisdom. Hmm. I, I mean, honestly, it's like, at least if we're talking in regards to light painting is enjoy the process. And as much as I hate, like it's not about like the journey or it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. Like that's a hundred percent what light painting is, Mm -hmm. is you're just remember to have fun and that we're all creating together and that it's a collaborative sort of thing. And that's one of the things I love about it is it's not just me directing a model. It's, Hey, like let's work together to create something. And that (laughs) brings me so much joy because I could just do it myself, yeah, but there's it's not the same as creating with somebody else and there's there's not a better feeling. Mm-hmm. How do you how do you find the people that you work with most of the time? Most of the time they're just my friends. Right. And you know, I or I join like a photography community and then I'll meet models that way and you know, because I've been doing light painting for a while, like people know that light painting mm-hmm. is my thing, so they might reach out and be like, "Hey, you know, if you're ever available, you need a model, like let me know. I would love to do that." Right. And so, you know, I'll go that way and be like Hey, I have this idea. Let me know if you're down. Because most of the time, if I'm doing it for fun, I'm like, hey, I'm trying some new stuff out. Yeah. So if you're down to try this, like, let me know. If not, that's cool too. But most of the time it's, hey, I want to do this for me. And if you want to be a part of that and get some like cool pictures out of it, then that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's usually when I am doing stuff, you know, in my studio, um, that's kind of the same thing. I try to I try to let people know that like this is me. This is the the equivalent of me just like practicing, you know, a sport. You know, like I'm going out to like practice some you know basketball or something. It's like I just need, but I can't do it by myself. I mm-hmm. need you to be there. So we're just gonna play around with a bunch of things. This might work. It might not. It, it also kind of like makes the process enjoyable because you know that there's no pressure there. You know, you can just have fun with it. And if nothing comes out, I mean, usually you'll get at least one or two things that mm-hmm. comes out, but oh yeah, the whole point is just to kind of play and to get familiar with it. Yep. Yep. Are you, are you guys <laughs> thinking what I'm thinking? No. Did we just become friends? <laughs> yes. And on that note, thank you, Russell, for <laughs> swinging by. Looking forward to hanging out with you more. Hell yeah. Jason, any final thoughts? Um, brush twice daily. Brush twice daily. <laughs> Well, that's all for today's podcast. Join us next time for more interesting discussion about the wonderful world of photography and her dark magical secrets. I'm fascinated with Instagram. It's such a simple construct. Just take a picture and post it on the internet. The other day, I took a picture of my neighbor's pet rabbit. He told me not to post it, but you know, I did anyway. Wow, 